This is a production of Cornell University. <laughs> um, so I will talk about reactive oxygen species and about stress. So I will basically talk uh, first about raw signaling, then about stress combination, and then I will try to put these two together under the umbrella of the One World, One Health uh, hypothesis. Uh, so let's start uh, talking about reactive oxygen species. So um, I listed some of them here. There are partly reduced or activated forms of oxygen. Uh, they're byproducts of aerobic metabolism, and they can be toxic to cells, especially in the presence of iron. Uh, this is the, the famous or infamous Fenton reaction. And most people think that ROS are bad. And back in the early 80s, they got a really bad reputation, uh, work from Lester Pecker. And a lot of people were taking a lot of antioxidants, really unneeded. Uh, but anyway, so in, in recent years, uh, we have a really a new view of ROS that's actually good and required for life. So if this is a uh, um, depiction of the level of ROS in the cell, if the level of ROS will go too low, the cell will go into a cytostatic state, won't be able to do much. If it's too high, we'll go into a cytotoxic state, that's oxidative stress. But if you keep ROS at the redox biology range, uh, then ROS and especially hydrogen peroxide are very important signal transduction molecules. They regulate protein structure function by oxidative post-translational modification and they regulate transcription factor, kinases, phosphatases, channels, and many other proteins, and regulate a lot of important processes. So how do you keep ROS in the, in the redox biology range? Well, this is sort of the five principles. I, I remind people, Hamsa, five principles. Uh, you control the rate of production, you control the rate of scavenging, but you can also control the rate of transport because you can transport hydrogen peroxide out of different organelles or even outside of the cell. You have to chelate free metals, and you have to constantly repair damage. So if you do all these five processes all the time, then ROS really are very important signal transduction molecules in the cell. Okay, so as we all know, the plant environment can be really dynamic. There can be extreme changes in different conditions. I'm not going to go into all this. And to survive, plants need to acclimate. And one of the things that plants do to acclimate is systemic signaling. Uh, and systemic signaling uh, is defined as the ability of plant to mobilize a signal from a small group of cells, let's say these cells that experience a, a signal or a stress or a stimuli to the rest of the plant. And one, this can be triggered by different stimuli, biotic, abiotic. Once this, this signal reaches the systemic tissue, it will trigger acclimation. I will mainly talk about systemic acquired acclimation, but there is also systemic acquired resistance, systemic wound response I will mention too. Uh, and uh, this has been studied extensively. Uh, a lot of long distance systemic signals are known. Uh, hormones, electric signals, calcium wave, ROS wave, pH waves, peptides, whatever. A lot of work uh, I'm summarizing in this slide. And I want to mention that they can be moving from a leaf to, to the shoot or the root, from the root to whole shoot, and so forth. So, uh, I'm going to, this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the ROS wave. Uh, and this is a process that my lab discovered in 2009. And what is the ROS wave? It's basically a cell-to-cell -cell signaling pathway. Uh, in this pathway, if a cell starts making ROS, the cell next to it will sense it and start making ROS. And this will propagate like this throughout the plant. And uh, the reason I'm saying autocatalytic is that I can come centimeters away from where I initiated it. And I can do a grafting experiment or put an inhibitor, and I can block it. Okay, So it's really, really not diffusion. And I'll talk a bit about this. Um, and the rate is about 0.2 to 0.5 centimeters per minute. And it depends on the enzymes called uh, ARBOs, respiratory burst oxidase homologs. Uh, in leaf, it's DNF, equivalent of NOx5 in mammalian. These are plasma membrane protein that use a, an ADPH to make superoxide in the apoplast that then, then this mutates to hydrogen peroxide. <coughs> so as I said before, this is not diffusion. If this is the local tissue and this is the systemic, ROS are not make it, made in the local and diffuse all the way to the systemic. This is be, basically almost impossible because they will get scavenged along the way. Um, so this is not a gradient. This is not diffusion. What it is, you can think of it as a binary code. Okay, A cell can be either at a resting state, a zero, or an activated state, a high ROS producing, okay? 
Uh, and when a cell sends, like say this cell will sense now that the cell preceding it makes ROS, it will start making ROS. And this will propagate like that, okay? So ROS are not diffusing, but what's moving is information in the form of altered ROS production from no or low to high, okay? And so you can view it as like a domino effect, okay? So all these cells are already making ROS. This is the front of the wave, and the next cell will start making ROS now, okay? And, and these cells will start making gross, and they will keep making gross sometimes for hours, depending on the physiological situation. Uh, and and uh, they will uh, acclimate to stress. Uh, and we have done a lot of studies about the ROS wave. We found that it, it does a lot of different things. It coordinates many physiological responses, molecular, metabolic. It integrates different. I'm not going to show all this. It's required for acclimation. Uh, I'll show two examples. Um, and this is an example of stomatal responses. So I can take an Arabidopsis plant and I can shine light through a, a LED fiber optic, highlight or excess light on this part of the leaf and the stomata will close. Uh, but they will also close within minutes in a, in a systemic leaf, okay? And it's not only one systemic leaf. If I do it, for example, for this leaf, all these leaves will close their stomata. And if I heat the leaf, I give it a heat stress, all of them will open. And this is mediated by the ROS wave. Without the ROS wave, you don't have that response. And it's sort of like the whole plant, it's a coordinate the response of the whole plant. It's like, a, I, I tend to say it's like a coral, right? How they all, all the cells are responding in unison. So this is an important role of the ROS wave, coordinating uh, physiological responses. Another experiment is shown here. If I take a, an Arabidopsis plant and I shine highlight only on this leaf, and then I do a transcriptomic analysis at zero to uh, for an eight minutes of this leaf and a systemic leaf. And you can see that altogether there is a very good overlap because this is a systemic response that will make this leaf now acclimated to highlight. And I can then take this leaf, this, these transcripts at the local and the systemic leaf, and I can do clustering to, let's say, these are the transitly in, uh, responding transcript. There is this overlap. So, so I want you to remember this number, 2,300, okay? Look what happened to this number if I do this in a mutant that have a very suppressed ROS wave, RBOD, uh, almost no ROS wave whatsoever, it's very slow, it goes down to six, okay? So this is, this ROS wave is really important for coordinating rapid responses, okay? You still have an overlap, uh, but you don't have acclimation anymore and you don't have rapid responses that are transmitted from the local leaf to the systemic leaf. So when we uh, discovered that, we used uh, transgenic plants that has ZAT12 the ZAT12 promoter fused to luciferase. Uh, we didn't want to discover that. We wanted to develop a system where we can screen for mutants that are deficient in raw signaling. Uh, but we discovered that there is a systemic response. Uh, but of course, this does not really measure ROS, okay? Uh, so when I moved um, six years ago to Missouri, I purchased this uh, imager. This imager is used for mammalian work. It's called Ivis Lumina, um, and it's used to image, it's very, very sensitive. It's used to Im image, you can inject, for example, G RFP labeled cancer cells under the skin of a mice, and you can follow their migration, okay? Uh, but we developed methods to uh, image whole plants, live whole plants growing in soil for ROS, okay? Uh, and this is shown here, for example, these two plants were treated with a dye called DCF, and the trick is, we don't spray, we don't dip, we fumigate. So we take nebulizers, medical nebulizers that create a mist. It's like a mist. We put the plants in this mist for half an hour. They soak in the dye, whatever we want. Then we take them, we treat them, we put them in the imager, okay? And I can talk more about this method. Uh, but essentially, you can see then I stimulate this leaf with highlight. I can see the ROS in a whole plant. And these, again, are plants just growing in soil. Uh, I can wound. I can dip this leaf in a mixture of bacteria that will uh, give a, a hypersensitive response and I will immediately see a systemic ROS wave. Uh, and here is a movie showing, and this leaf was treated. Uh, and you can see that this leaf and the first leaf, two leaves that have the best phloem connection to it will, will light up first, but then the rest of the plant will light up. And always the treated leaf behaves differently than the other leaves well, because it was treated, it was stressed, either wounded or subjected to highlight. So don't expect it to be like all the other tissues. Um, 
We can use this for imaging, and I'll show you, of different types of ROS. So we use DCF for general ROS. We use peroxy orange one for hydrogen peroxide. We can use it for calcium imaging. We can use it for membrane potential imaging. Uh, and this, the advantage of this is we don't need to transform the plant with uh, ratiometric or a GFP base, uh, anything. We just fumigate the plants and image them. Uh, and that allows us to screen hundreds of mutants now, okay? So that's really an uh, advantage. But of course, we always also, for some things, use GCAMP, so we can image with this imager calcium, raw GFP or P1 for hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we can do that too, okay? So, uh, as I said, we discovered the, the, the Ross wave in 2009, and several years later, the labs of Tina Romis and Simon Guillory discovered the calcium wave. I did not discover the calcium wave, uh, disclaimer. Uh, and then we wrote a review where we hypothesized how these things co you know, work together. And we thought, well, Arbo will make ROS, ROS will make calcium going to the cytosol, activate CPKs, phosphorylates Arbo in this cell, make ROS, change calcium here. And therefore, this is how it will propagate from cell to cell. Now, that's a very nice story, but we have a lot of questions. What calcium, what channels, what's the role of plasmodesmata, and so forth. So having this imager, imaging method developed, we could screen, we screen over 100, 200 mutants. Uh, just showing you briefly examples. So this is like CNGC2 in response to highlight stress. This is wild type. These are two independent mutants of CNGC2. And you can see, of course, there is no response, right? Uh, this is the GLR 3.3, 3.6. In response to highlight, you have a suppressed ROS wave. In response to winding, you have no ROS wave. So you can start dissecting this, okay? I'm making a very long story of several years of work short. This is the model where we are now. Uh, we know that stress will 